Hello, everyone. My name is Sigrid. Thank you for joining our virtual Kids Town Hall today. We're holding today's event to give Congresswoman Spanberger a chance to hear from kids across Central Virginia and to talk a bit about some of the changes and challenges we are all facing during this unusual time. In the next hour, we will answer as many questions as possible about your experiences as kids in Virginia's 7th District, how Congresswoman Spanberger and others have been working to help people during this time, and other issues related to coronavirus that may be on your mind. As I mentioned, this event is an interactive town hall. We would love to hear questions from you about coronavirus and the changes you and your family may be experiencing in your day-to-day -day lives. If you are joining us in the Zoom webinar, you can ask a question by using one of the features that appear along the bottom of your screen. If you select Q&A, please type your question, your name, and age, and it will be sent to our moderator. If you select raise your hand, you will join the line to ask your question live. When you hear your name called, please say your question, your name, and your age out loud so the Congresswoman can answer. If you are joining us via Facebook Live today, you can still ask a question by typing your question in the comment section. A note for our parents and guardians, there is no need to share your name or age in a Facebook comment. We could receive a lot of questions during today's event. If we are not able to address your question, please give our office a call at 804-401-4110. Again, that's 804-401-4110. And now, Congresswoman Spanberger, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, my name is Abigail Spanberger and I am the representative for Virginia's 7th District. And the 7th District of Virginia has 10 counties in total. Uh, we start, if you're looking at the map of Virginia, we start all the way up at Culpeper and we go all the way south to Nottoway County. I live in Henrico County, right smack dab in the middle of the district. And I'm excited to have a conversation today with some of our younger constituents for today's Kids Town Hall. I am joined uh, by two lovely, helpful moderators. This is my daughter, Catherine, who's a kindergartner, and my daughter, Charlotte, who's a third grader. Uh, and I have one more daughter who's a middle schooler, and I believe she's working on her history homework right now. So um, I, in Congress, uh, and I know depending upon what ages you are, so in Congress, um, I am in the House of Representatives, the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, make up the legislative branch. And then of course, in our larger government, we have the executive branch and the judicial branch. I was elected in 2018. And typically my job has me going back and forth between the district, so back home where I live and the communities I represent, and Washington, DC. But during this time of coronavirus, we have seen a significant change in the way everybody's working. And that includes for members of Congress. Usually up on Capitol Hill, I'm on the floor of the House of Representatives. That's the place where we go to vote and we go to debate things. And we're usually bumping into each other elbows with 400, more than 400 people there at a time talking about the issues, debating issues and voting frequently. And then when I come home back to the back to the district, that's when I'm out meeting people, going to businesses, going to festivals, going to all sorts of different places. Uh, but because of social distancing and coronavirus, when I'm back home in the district, I have been mostly doing lots of telephone conversations. I've done some visits to a couple places where we were um, very careful and I wore a mask. Uh, just this morning, I did one of those. Uh, and then when I've been on Capitol Hill, they've changed the way we vote completely because there's so many of us now we go in a couple people at a time, or we sit either on the floor, um, or we sit up in the galleries, which is where tourists would normally sit during the time that we are uh, voting or speaking or debating. There's a lot to discuss today, so we are gonna get right to your questions. Uh, and I wanna thank you so much for, for joining us today. To the parents, thank you so much for allowing your kids to join. I hope this is helpful. Um, or at least a, a, a fun thing to talk about later tonight. And Secret, I'll kick it back to you. Thank you, Congresswoman Spanberger. So to start off today, we're going to hear a couple questions that we received via email. 
And we're gonna hear those from Charlotte Spanberger. Charlotte, take it away. Sophia, second grade. When are we going back to school? When will my school open? When will I be back? Will I be back in school at fall? So this is an important question. We got this question from Sophia, but it was a question that a lot of other kids asked as well. Um, right now, we are working as though um, we are all going to be headed back to school in the fall. I have had conversations with superintendents across our 10 counties, uh, with board of uh, uh, with school board members, and everybody's working towards the same thing. Everybody wants to work towards getting back to as close of a normal circumstance as we possibly can. But a lot of this is going to get driven by health needs, by public health requirements, and we want to make sure that when everybody goes back to school, uh, that people can be as safe as possible. And so I know that the superintendents of your schools are thinking about really important things like how do you keep kids safe in the cafeteria where you might spread germs a bit more? Um, how do you keep kids safe in the class? And these are all the things that our great educators are talking about um, across the seventh district and across Virginia. So right now, my hope is that these two and you, Sophia, will be headed back to school uh, right at their normal time. Um, but you know, with the science of this virus and where we're headed, there may be some adjustments to that. And your school day might look a little bit different. For the older kids who are used to doing sports, we're probably gonna have a little bit of, a, of an extra time before we start getting back into sporting events and some of the usual after school activities as well. Hudson, third grade. How do you stay organized and keep up with all your work? Thank you, Hudson. How do I stay organized and keep up with my work? Well, in my introduction, I said that work has gotten very different because usually I'm going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, since the coronavirus crisis has really started, um, I have been mostly back home in the district, uh, working virtually or remotely. Some of you may have family members who are working remotely, so that means I spend a lot of time with earbuds in my ear um, and on cameras talking to people. I serve on two different committees in Congress, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Agriculture Committee, and we have done a lot of meetings uh, via conferences like this where we can see each other's faces or conferences where we can uh, just hear each other. We've lit talked to witnesses, we've discussed and, and debated and talked about issues, so that's been very, very important. Um, and how do I stay organized? Um, you know, I'm usually a little bit of an organized person, but I sometimes have stacks and piles of paper. Is, is that true? Yeah. Um, so I have been working at the dining room table with all of my mess, um, my, my computers, uh, my, the telephones that I use, and the phone rings off the hook. Um, so I have just worked hard staying organized by, you know, really working all the time. Um, and I have a great team, uh, Ms. Sigrid, who is the one who's a moderator. She works normally in our Washington, D.C. office, but because of coronavirus, she's working from her apartment. Our whole team is working from various different places. And so we've been uh, doing lots of phone calls, lots of uh, organizing meetings, and, um, you know, it, it, we're working hard, and that's the important piece. And I think that there's a big change because, you know, usually I'm back and forth, back and forth, and usually, Congress, if you turn on the TV on C-SPAN, you see hundreds of people on the floors of the Congress. And so people might be thinking, are you guys working? What are you doing? But the reality is, is we've shift, com shifted completely, and we're focused in a really different way. And so it's, as I said, we're doing a lot of meetings like this where we talk to each other. We're working on really big bills. And because the community is hurting so much, we have actually passed uh, multiple really huge um, bills uh, for the younger kids, that's like a, a bunch of laws, right? So packages is, is for the older kids. Packages addressing the needs of our community, support to small businesses, support to people, support to unemployment, support to hospitals, these large packages, you know, uh, trillions of dollars in aid. And we've been negotiating that all on the phone and from afar. So it's been a challenge and uh, it's, it's been interesting. There's a lot of moments where we will, and if any of the parents will listen in, and you're probably going to understand this, where you hear somebody start to, you ask a question, and then you say, oh, I think you're still on mute. So there's a couple moments throughout the day, usually, where you hear somebody, you got to remind somebody that they're on mute and you can't hear them. But Hudson, thank you for your question.
And I think we're gonna do one more from the ones that were sent in and then we'll kick it back to Secret. Rashad, five years old. Is it safe for me to visit my grandparents since they're older? How can I do this that in a safe way? So Rashad is worried about visiting his grandparents. So one of the problems that we see with this virus, apart from the fact that it makes people very sick, um, is that in order to keep people from catching it, we have to stay apart from each other, which is why kids aren't in school, which is why so many of our stores are closed. Um, and it's a real challenge for us. And it's a real challenge, particularly as it relates to our friends and our neighbors and our grandparents who are older, because this virus is really harmful um, it, it can be very harmful for everybody, but it's really dangerous for older people um, to get this virus. And so it's important for all of us to do our best uh, to not go places and not get out in public because we want to make sure that we're keeping this virus uh, from infecting others. But Rashad's question is about whether or not he can visit his, his grandparents. And the answer is it depends on, you know, what his grandparents are comfortable with. Um, my kids have seen their grandparents a couple times. They don't touch them, which is really sad because they do love to give hugs and kisses to grandparents. Um, and you can wear a mask, you can wave. But the other cool thing is you can also try to talk to them in different ways. You might FaceTime them, you might talk to them on the phone, you can be a pen pal with your grandparents. And so just because you can't see them and hug them, Rashad, doesn't mean that you can't kind of spend some quality time with them. But if you do go see them, you should try not to touch, and unless they're a family member who lives with you, you should try not to touch them and you should try to stay a little bit apart so in case you have to sneeze or cough, uh, you don't get germs on each other. Thank you so much, Charlotte. We are going to take a few questions now from our uh, live participants. So we have a question from Cecilia, who is 16 years old, and she asks, how do you think little kids are adjusting to the virus? Uh, and how should we talk about the virus with our brothers and sisters and our friends and family? So Congresswoman Spanberger, what would you say to Cecilia? And is Cecilia on the line right now? We got Cecilia's question over text. So Cecilia is listening in. Perfect. Um, Cecilia, I appreciate this question because I think it's important that, you know, so many grownups and with the school closures, it's very clear to kids of all ages and to adults that this is a really serious time. And so the way that we wanna talk about this, I, I think is by making sure that people know it is serious. This, we're talking about a real disease that can be dangerous, but there are things that we can do. Um, so you know, we don't wanna hide the truth from people, but we also wanna make sure that little ones, even the littlest siblings know that they can take action. They can wash hands. Right, And so the problem with this virus is it's very contagious. Usually during flu season or during um, the regular, uh, in, in the springtime or in the fall, people get colds and you can catch a cold. This virus is different because it is so much more contagious than the flu. And for some people who get it, it's really harmful to them. And so we want to make sure that if we're touching things, if we're breathing deeply, that we're washing hands. And so the way that we can talk about this with kids is saying, yes, it's serious, but our community is taking good steps to address it, right? We're doing things, our businesses are closed, our, many of our restaurants are takeout only, our schools are closed. We're doing things in our community to try and stay safe. Um, and so everyone at all ages, they can participate in that. They can wash hands for 20 seconds or more with soap, and they can wash hands all the time um, because that's how you kill the germs. And they can wear a mask. And people might say, well, there's all different types of masks. There's the types that you wear at a hospital. Um, the girl's grandmother made a bunch of masks that are made out of cloth, and do they really work? Well, they do because what we're trying to do is to make sure that our germs aren't going out. Now, the people who work in hospitals, they need to have the really good quality masks so that the germs don't go in or out. But for us, what's important is we want to make sure if I go to the store and that as I'm walking around, if I have germs, I'm not passing them to other people. Because again, and this is an example of one of the masks, 
again, this disease, this virus is just very, very contagious. And that's the challenge here. So um, as it relates to how we talk about it with other kids or with kids, particularly younger brothers and siblings, we should make sure they're not afraid and make sure that they know that they can do things to protect themselves. And that across our community, we're doing a lot of things. Um, and that's you know, why they're out of school. And frankly, they're a big part of protecting the larger community because it's a sacrifice for kids to not be in school. Um, and it's an important one. And, and they're helping keep people safe by doing that. Thank you, Congresswoman. We're gonna turn to a couple of our raise your hand questions now. So if you've hit the raise your hand feature to join our line, thank you very much. We are gonna start off uh, with Joshua Davis, and then we'll head to Nathaniel Hurt, and then we'll head to e Eden Johnson. So if you're Joshua, Nathaniel, or Eden, stay tuned, because we're coming to you in just one second. So Nathaniel, I'm sorry, Joshua, we're gonna hit uh, uh, your button now, and you can ask the Congresswoman your question. Um, Go ahead, Joshua. Uh, what is the most difficult part of your job right now? Thank you for the question, Joshua. The most difficult part of my job right now is the fact that there are so many people in our community who are hurting. Uh, there are people who are sick. There are people who have family members who are sick. There are people who have spent their whole lives building a business and now that business is in danger. There are people who have lost their jobs and they're very worried. And so the hardest part of my job right now is trying to make sure that um, we're making the right decisions about how to help people and how to help their businesses and how to make sure they have food on the table and can, um, can provide for themselves and for their families. And, and so the hardest part, but you know, Joshua, this is exactly why I feel um, really lucky to be able to serve our community is that I have a great team of people. We are answering questions all day long, you know, and if you or any grownups in your life have questions about it's any of the bills that we've passed in Congress, any of the ways that our office can help, uh, they can call our office. We've helped people um, in understanding the loans that they can apply for. We've helped people ensure that they were able to get the checks that have gone out, the recovery rebates that have gone out to other people. We've helped people get back home to the United States who were outside of the country. We've helped people who were on cruise ships and got stuck and needed to get home. And so the hardest part is that um, we want to help everybody and we're working really hard to do that. I'm working really hard to do that, but it's still a really trying, difficult time. And so, um, we have people who share stories with us and some of them are happy and some of them are stories of hope, but many of them are stories of deep, deep sadness and concern. And so the hardest part is knowing that people are hurting and I can't just snap my fingers and make it go away, um, but I'm working really hard to help people wherever I possibly can and to make sure people know that our office is here to help people. Um, and I, I hope you are doing okay, Joshua, and I hope your family's okay. Thank you, Congresswoman Spanberger. We're gonna take another question from our uh, raise your hand option now. Our next person in line uh, is Nathaniel Hurt. And then after that, we're going to head to Eden Johnson. So if you're Eden, uh, you're up next. So now Nathaniel Hurt, I'm gonna hit your button and please ask your question for the Congresswoman. Representative Spanberger, um, I have a question about um, restoring our economy. Uh, We've spent these trillions of dollars uh, on coronavirus and helping small businesses um, around the country. Um, how are we going to restore our economy um, after this is over and even starting now? Yeah, well, and thank you for that question. So we have, on a bipartisan, bicameral basis, committed trillions of dollars in the immediacy of this crisis. Um, in the immediacy of the crisis of helping our workforce, helping our small businesses, helping our, our hospital systems. And, and those are investments in our future uh, that I think were vitally, vitally important for us to have made. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that our fiscal trajectory, our fiscal status um, is a challenged one. Uh, before 
this crisis hit, this public health crisis, this economic crisis, we were in a challenged place from a debt and deficit standpoint, um, particularly in recent years, even uh, just back in 2017, we, tax, we passed uh, a tax bill. This is before I was in Congress, but we passed a tax bill that significantly cut revenues to our, uh, to our country, uh, you know, when we're still coming out of the 2008 recession. So, you know, I don't think it was smart or wise to have uh, made the decision to cut revenues because it put us in a place where we had even less uh, wiggle room, essentially, to deal with this crisis. Um, how we actually contend with it will depend on a lot of factors. Uh, the bottom line is we have to deal with it. We have to get our fiscal house in order. And for the younger kids on the phone, when we talk about fiscal issues, those are issues related to money. So fiscal with an F, not, not like physical fitness. Um, so the money issues, basically how much money our country has and how much money our country owes um, it is a vitally, vitally important issue for us to contend with. I have um, and continue to be a uh, someone, there's a rule in Congress called the PAYGO rule where we um, assert that we need to have ways to pay for the legislation that costs uh, dollars that are not just straight, that are not potential investments. I'm a supporter of a balanced budget amendment trying to move this country to our place like Virginia. Virginia has to balance its budget. Virginia uh, requires that we make sound financial decisions. And I think it's vital that we get to a point uh, where we can do that in the future. We've done it uh, in my lifetime multiple times, balanced the budget, um, but we, of course, in recent years have made some, uh, some challenging decisions. Right now, I think it was right for us uh, to address the immediacy of this crisis and frankly, depending upon where this trajectory of the crisis goes, how quickly we can open up our businesses, uh, how quickly our economy rebounds, um, and that's how much people are actually going out and spending money. We, if we open tomorrow, would our stores and restaurants be open? You know, there's a lot that remains to be seen based on the actual consumer psyche. So how are, our, um, how are we rebounding? What happens with our unemployment rate? Just last week, we had 3.8 million Americans file for unemployment in one week. Uh, we are still on the upward uh, heading in the wrong direction when it comes to unemployment, which is more and more, millions more Americans each week filing for unemployment. Um, and so depending upon how fast it, we can stabilize our employment numbers, how fast we can bring back up um, our economic engagement, you know, all of these things will depend on whether or not, you know, what sort of decisions we need to make about further investments to helping during this time of crisis, um, or at what point in time, you know, are we able to see ourselves back um, on a more stabilized ground? And then, and then from there, we need to go back to the, the discussions that, frankly, you know, I've been a part of for the last year in Congress, which is how do we get our financial house in order? Um, those discussions have been ongoing since I got to Congress. Um, I have advocated for, uh, since this crisis began, also really strong oversight for where we're spending our government dollars. I think that's an important piece. Uh, making investments in our people and our businesses is vitally important, but we need to make sure that those uh, dollars are going where they were intended, are going to the people and the businesses who need them, uh, and that there isn't... Um, any waste or fraud in the system. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Spanberger. Uh, we're gonna take another question from our raise your hand feature, and then we'll get some of our people who have been uh, sending in questions via chat. Just a reminder, if you're using the Q&A option uh, through our Zoom webinar, or if you're typing a question on our Facebook Live and watching that way, just remember to put your name, uh, no need to put your age if you don't want to, or maybe if mom and dad don't want to, that's okay, but please add your name so we can uh, make sure that we know who we're talking to. So now we're gonna head over to Eden Johnson. Uh, Eden, I'm about to hit your button, and then you will go ahead and ask your question to the Congresswoman. Take it away, Eden. Hi. So. Thank you for doing this today, by the way. I just wanted to say that first. But like everyone else, I'm really anxious to get back to school. And when we do enter the classroom, it's sure to be different. What are you thinking the school day is going to look like when we get back? 
Thank you for your question, Eden. You know, and the answer is, I, I don't know. Um, I have talked to various different educators, to superintendents, uh, to school board members, and everybody wants to get back to a place where we're, uh, our community schools are able to provide for the students, for our students, for people like you, Eden, what they always have, which is a lot more than just processing and giving information. I spoke to a superintendent just earlier this week who said our schools are about so much more than just distributing information. They're about sports. They're about you know, emotional growth. They're about the friendships that people form. They're about the relationships that students have with their teachers. And so, you know, my hope is right now, uh, the schools have responded really well, are working really hard to try and deliver information to students who are all, um, you know, spread across their counties and their school districts. Um, but my hope, and this is what I know the superintendents and, and the schools and the principals and teachers are trying to work towards is a place where schools can get back to being those locations where you go not just to learn and receive information, but where you learn about yourself and where you participate in sports and um, where it's, a, it's broader than just distribution of information. So what it looks like, um, I can't answer that. I will leave it up to the, the experts on how to structure a school day, but I do think that they will be taking a lot of information um, in as it relates to how do they keep students safe? How does this impact bus schedules or you know, bus seating, cafeteria seating, uh, sports, uh, gym class, all of the places where you might be more susceptible to getting germs and, and seeing the spread of germs. So I'm sorry I don't have a direct answer for you, Eden, but I, I do know that all of the adults who would be making these decisions uh, for you and for the other kids on the line are really focused on trying to get us back to a place where school um, gets back to a, a little bit more normalcy um, while also ensuring that you and all of the other students are safe. Thank you, Congresswoman. We're gonna take one question that we received over the text option, our Q&A option now. Eliza, who is seven years old, asks, how do we know that six feet is the closest we can get to others, and should we stick to that rule? Eliza, that number, the six feet number, is the estimate that people have made based on if you're breathing or if you're yelling, how far the particles um, and so kind of all of the germs from your mouth might go. Six feet is a really good guideline and a really safe distance to stay. It becomes very difficult sometimes uh, to stay six feet apart. Um, and, and so you should try for six feet whenever possible um, and because that's the distance at which you're keeping yourself safe and you're keeping the other people safe. Um, some people have said more than that. Um, I was reading if you're doing different types of activity, like if you're biking with someone, that you should be even further away because if you were to cough while on a bicycle, your germs will go behind you. If you're out running and exercising and, um, and maybe breathing and having more particles come out of your mouth at once, that it needs to be a further distance. But six feet is based on the science of what is recommended to, for you to not spread germs or get germs. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, we're going to take one more question from our Q&A uh, portion here, our text question. Uh, Amaya McAlexander asks, do masks really work and what else can we do uh, to protect ourselves when we're out and about? So kind of adding on to our question there about the six feet distance. So Masks, there's different types of masks that have different types of um, uses. You might have heard about the N95 masks. So those are a type of mask that seal very, very close up against your face. Those are the sort of masks that uh, doctors and nurses and hospital attendants should be using when they're dealing with patients who have COVID-19, right? So that even if someone's breathing heavily or if they come in contact with particles, that they stay safe. Then there's other types of masks that are used in hospitals and in nursing homes that are also um, you know, meant for uh, keeping people from spreading germs or from getting germs uh, to them. 
And then a lot of people, like before we were showing some of the masks that we wear, we wear the cloth ones because right now, you know, the purpose, if I was to wear this mask out in, uh, in public, the purpose of this mask is to keep it so that I don't breathe germs on other people. That if I have germs, they get stuck in the mask and they don't spread to other people. And that's really, really important. It does maybe help a little bit with the germs that might be coming my way, but that's why we wanna stay further apart whenever possible. Um, and, and I choose to wear the cloth masks because there are not a lot of the other masks available. We wanna make sure that um, you know, the doctors and the nurses have the supplies that they need because there have been shortages. Um, but the masks, they, they don't stop everything. So that's why you also want to avoid going out as, in public as much as you can. That's why you want to avoid um, play dates and all of the fun things that we used to be able to do. Um, and also you can, you can get the virus from, uh, it can be put on surfaces. And so that's why, you know, we're not allowed to play on playgrounds right now because you, there might be the virus that somebody puts, you know, their hands on, on something and then you put your hands on something and then you, you might get infected that way. And, um, and with this virus, the other thing is that some people can have the virus and they don't have any symptoms. And so that's why it's really important that even if you're feeling fine, you wear a mask because it's possible that you could have it or that others you know might have it and, and transmit it that way. And you should also, answering part of your question, also make sure you're washing your hands. Uh, that is so incredibly important. And hopefully once all of this is over, uh, we'll continue as a community washing our hands for 20 seconds all the time, because that's very healthy for your body and for our public health. Thank you, Congresswoman. As a reminder to anyone who may have joined us later, this is an interactive Kids Town Hall. If you are joining us in the Zoom webinar, you can ask a question by using one of the features that appear along the bottom of your screen. If you select Q&A, please type your question and your name, and it will be sent to our moderator. If you select raise your hand, you'll be added to our line to ask your question live. When you hear your name, please say your question and your name and the Congresswoman will answer. If you're joining us via Facebook Live, you can still ask a question by typing your question in the comment section. A note for our parents and guardians, please do not share a name or age in your Facebook comment. We could receive a lot of questions during the remainder of our event today, so if we're not able to address your question, please do feel free to give our office a call at 804-401-4110. Now we are gonna to go to our raise your hand questions. We have a couple more people in line. Uh, we're gonna start off with Antar, A-N-T-A-R, and then we'll head over to Aryan, A-R-Y-A-A-N. So if you are Antar or Aryan, you're almost up. And Antar, I'm gonna hit your button now and you can go ahead and ask your question for the Congresswoman. Hello, Congresswoman. My question is, um, with the shutdowns, they were meant to um, make sure the healthcare system was not overwhelmed. And I've seen the healthcare system not being overwhelmed. And I've seen other, many other states starting to reopen. So my question is, why hasn't Virginia starting to reopen? Because I know the governor has stated out a plan to reopen, but can you clarify that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so um, the, starting with how it is that we reopen, um, some states across the country have begun to reopen, other states have not. Um, you know, notably, Virginia has just started to allow elective surgeries again. Um, and so we are starting bit by bit to move in the direction of opening. Um, you know, state by state, and, and certainly I'll just speak for, you know, what we're doing here in Virginia, the decisions made about where Virginia should go is based heavily on uh, our infection rate. Um, we haven't yet stabilized our infection rate. We have been able um, to uh, pull the, the anticipated apex forward a bit, which has been helpful. Um, we haven't seen overwhelming, uh, we haven't seen any uh, hospitals that have been overly um, just consumed by COVID-19 cases as we have in some states like New York 
or Michigan, um, which was the intent, to your point, of, of the larger shutdowns. Um, but at this point in time, we need to ensure that we have uh, a steady decline of cases, which we are not there yet, so that all of the sacrifices that we've been making across our community to stop the spread of COVID, that we don't reverse those advances. So it's not enough to just um, kind of reach a plateau. We have to see a decline. Otherwise, uh, like some states that have opened or some states that have um, seen large groups of people uh, where they've seen increased levels of infection. So as of right now, uh, Virginia has made some uh, movement towards reopening. Again, I mentioned elective surgery, previously elected surgery and dental appointments, uh, like non-emergent dental appointments haven't been permitted. Um, that's a change. So we're taking the first step towards opening there because we've been able to mitigate the risk and now the risk of overwhelming the hospital systems. Um, we seem to have gotten that under control um, and it'll continue from there. Um, but the, the public health priorities and the science behind where we are is, is really vitally important. And part of that also, Antar, is related to testing. So we want to continue to make sure that we know where there are potential outbreaks. Um, in Virginia, we've seen hotspot style outbreaks um, where there's been smaller localities that have, have been tremendously impacted, uh, certainly more so than others. And we want to make sure that we can get ahead of where there might be potential outbreaks and be able to have uh, containment abilities in, in place. Thank you, Congresswoman Spanberger. Now we're going to go to Aryan with our next uh, raise your hand question. So Ariane, I'm about to hit the button and you can ask your question for the Congresswoman. Go ahead. Oh, looks like we may have lost Ariane. That's okay. We're going to go to our next question. Uh, Riley, who sent in a question via the Q&A, uh, asked, what are you doing uh, to make sure that kids who are out of school right now and what can teachers be doing to make sure that they're ready to go into their next grade in the fall? So thank you for this question, Riley. Uh, my children who were here earlier, as I said, I've got a, a kindergarten, a third grader, and a sixth grader. I think our teachers are doing a really great job. Um, they're trying really hard to ensure that our kids and kids in the community have schoolwork that they can do throughout the remainder of the year so that they can be ready for next year. Uh, this is top of mind for our superintendents and for all of our principals and vice principals and teachers. Um, you know, where it's possible, many kids are doing uh, Zoom meetings or online programs with their teachers, uh, working to make sure that they are ready to enter next year. Uh, that's not possible in all places because we don't have internet everywhere across the 7th district, which is a big issue that I've been working on. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a change on our communities and our teachers are really going to have to make sure that, you know, next year uh, they're adapting because there will be some information that, you know, maybe kids didn't totally absorb or totally remember. But, you know, and I think unfortunately with the pattern of summer break that we do have, teachers are used to students forgetting a little bit. Um, but it's going to require that students work really hard to catch up and teachers work hard to really catch up. Um, and for all of you who are receiving either school packets or online work, it's important that you all keep up with that so that um, there's as little of a, of a loss of information um, as possible. Thank you, Congresswoman. We have another question that came in via text uh, from Penny, who is eight years old. And Penny has an important question, just to get back to the basics, what is the coronavirus and why is this such a big problem for Virginia right now? Well, Penny, thank you for your question. The coronavirus is a type of illness that can spread uh, through contact between people. And so frequently we have, and if you've ever had a cold that you might catch, and if you have a brother or sister, you might accidentally give it to your brother and sister. It's like that, but it's a lot more serious. And so sometimes you might hear about flu season where you know a bunch of people get the flu and they kind of don't feel very well. Um, and sometimes you have to get a flu vaccine or a shot. Uh, so the coronavirus is a type of virus 
that is very, very contagious. It's also very new. Uh, so the first time that there's been any scientists who knew about the coronavirus uh, as of right now was about November 2019. So the coronavirus is also called COVID-19 because it was discovered in 2019. And it comes from a larger family of diseases that have existed for a while, but COVID-19, the coronavirus we're talking about, is different in that it was recently discovered um, and it spreads very, very quickly. Um, and so at first people wondered, well, is it similar to the flu or is it different? Should I be worried? And it is different because it's very, very contagious. It's also different and it's also a challenge because people can, uh, some people who get it get very, very sick and some people who get it don't have any symptoms that seem different. So you can have people, and this is some, one of the reasons why schools have closed and businesses have closed, is because there are some people who have it and they can spread it to other people. And then for the other people, it might get very, very um, harmful to their health. And so this is one of the reasons why we wanna make sure we're washing hands for at least 20 seconds. This is why we wanna make sure that when we go out in public, um, if we go out in public, that we're covering our mouths just in case you have germs, you don't wanna pass germs to other people. Um, but it is, it is a disease, it's a virus um, that is just a really not a very good virus. Um, and right now there's lots of scientists who are working very, very hard to figure out if we can make a vaccine for this virus. Um, but it takes a while to develop that technology um, because we want to get to a place where we have a vaccine that works. People can go and get vaccinated uh, like we can for the flu or for chicken pox. Um, and we'll probably be living with this virus in our community um, and in our country and in the world for a long time. Um, but that's why we have scientists hard, hard at work trying to come up with both treatments for people who are sick and vaccines so that in the future, people will not get this disease. Um, so thank you for your question, Penny. And I hope that answers it for you. Thank you, Congresswoman. We're gonna take a couple more of our raise your hand questions. We have a couple people in line. So we're gonna to go to Tessa uh, Graman and then Rebecca Hatcher. So Tessa, if you're ready, I'm about to hit your button and you can ask your question for the Congresswoman. Go ahead, Tessa. Oh, do we have Tessa? Okay. Uh, Rebecca Hatcher, we're going to hop on over to you and we'll try and circle back and get Tessa uh, connected here in a second. Go ahead, uh, Rebecca. Okay, looks like we're having some trouble getting Rebecca. Uh, Congresswoman, we're gonna circle back there in two seconds, but we have one more question uh, from our Q&A section where people have sent in questions. Uh, Parker asks, what can people be doing to help others who are going through hard times right now? Parker, thank you for the kindness uh, exhibited in your question. Thank you for wanting to help. There's a whole lot of things that people can do if they wanna help. Uh, and it can start with um, being appreciative of the people in your life who are helping you. So any grown-ups in your life, uh, you know, maybe making your bed and being a little bit tidy, uh, that might be helpful for, um, for kids who are a bit older and have the ability uh, to potentially organize uh, and talk to the grownups in their life about maybe donating to the food bank locally. There's a lot of food banks and for some people, uh, for many, many people, this is a really difficult time. We've had many, many Americans, many people across our community who have lost their jobs. Um, and so it's a hard time for many people. So to be able to, if you can donate canned goods or if you can donate dollars to the food banks uh, around us, that's a way that we can help. Um, for if you have little brothers or sisters, you can help by reading to them, by helping uh, them with activities. Um, within, 
within some communities, if you have the ability to sew and you can make masks for other volunteers, that's a nice thing to do. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways that we can help um, if you want to make a sign for your yard and just say thank you to all of our frontline workers, um, that's a nice thing to do. Make a thank you card for your um, mail carrier. Thank, make a thank you card for the sanitation workers, the people who you know, pick up the trash at your house. Those are ways that, that you can show appreciation and you can help people during this hard time. Um, and, you know, I don't think Ms. Secret said how old you are, so I, I, I'm trying to do the broad spectrum. Um, but there are a lot of, and, and let me just tell everybody, in, in case you don't, haven't heard about frontline workers. So frontline workers are, um, you know, people who are continuing to make our whole community work. So those are people who are picking up our trash. Those are people who are working at the grocery stores. Those are people who are, um, whose jobs require that, they, that they're going to work and that they're working from, uh, you know, the store where they work. Um, so that our community continues to go. Those are uh, the letter carriers, uh, the post office workers, our UPS and FedEx drivers, you know, people who are continuing to, to help, our school district workers who are making meals for kids who need um, food assistance from the schools. Um, you know, there's a lot of people working really hard, people who volunteer at our local food banks, and of course, uh, our doctors and our nurses and our healthcare workers. So anytime you can show appreciation, or if you do want to do um, any donations to, to food banks, there's a really good way to, to donate um, or to help because there are so many people who are in need right now. Thank you, Congresswoman. We're still trying to get connected to a few of our friends here, but in the meantime, we're going to go to Sophia Silva, who has her hand raised in the line. Sophia, I'm about to hit your button and you can ask your question for the Congresswoman. Looks like that switched over. Mason, Mason, would you like to ask your question for the Congresswoman? Uh, yes, hi Congresswoman. So I am an eighth grader and getting ready to go into high school. And since we are in lockdown and I might not be able to go, and you have a daughter in middle school, what do you think our plans are gonna be for this year, this 2020 year since it hasn't come off to a good start? Yeah, well, thank you, Mason, and good luck with finishing out the rest of your schoolwork for eighth grade, and certainly good luck as you enter high school. Um, you know, in all of my conversations with school superintendents and with principals, um, and even the educators I know in my life, I know that the important thing, the priority is for kids to be able to get back to school and for it to seem as normal as possible. Um, it is really the educators who are trying to make good and fast decisions about how to get kids back to school, how to make school feel and be normal again, and how to continue teaching the vital information uh, that you should be learning at school. So everybody's been pretty adaptive so far, uh, trying to make sure that if, if you have internet access, you can get your, um, your homework and your work on the computer uh, or packets for those who need it. Um, but headed into the fall, you know, the hope is that we can have school look a lot more like school than what we have right now. Um, but there may need to be changes. So you know, I, I think particularly for anybody if you're going back to the school you're used to, it might look and feel different. And if you're headed to you know, middle school or high school for the first time, there might be adjustments. So for you, Mason, if you're going to middle or high school, you know, there might be some changes in how high school sports happen. You know, and this is gonna change. It might even change county to county or school to school um, because the, the superintendents and the principals and the teachers are gonna do what's best to keep kids safe. Um, and keep kids safe uh, and their families safe. Uh, so we don't know yet what it will look like, uh, but I know that all the adults in your life are really committed to having it look back to as normal as possible, but we need to make sure that uh, our, the public health is, is a top concern to keep kids safe at school and to keep it so that schools don't become a place where we spread this virus. Thank you, Congresswoman. We've got one question that came in, uh, a Q&A option from Emily, who's 10. Uh, and this is a question that a lot of people have asked today. 
what do you think uh, we should do about going to summer camp? And if we can't go to summer camp, what are some of the things that you and your kids are going to be doing uh, to have fun uh, this summer at home? Well, Emily, um, I hope that kids can go to summer camp because I, you know, I have three kids who are very much looking forward to summer camp. Um, you know, a lot of these decisions um, are going to be made based on science and based on information about what keeps kids safe. Um, if it is a real, real challenge, there might come a point if uh, we're at the whole state level, the governor might say, you know, we're not ready to go back to summer camp. Though none of those announcements have been made. So right now we're really focused um, that locality to locality or, and really camp to camp that there's different decisions being made. Um, you know, I, I do hope that we continue uh, to make progress in fighting this virus. And when we reach a point where we see steady, steady declines, then hopefully we'll be able to return to uh, regular activities like summer camp. Um, you know, like school, some of the summer camps, depending upon what type of camp they are, they might need to change, you know, aspects of how they feed kids or how close kids can sit. Um, and these are a lot of the decisions that camp counselors and the adults who run camps are going to have to make based on uh, information they get from doctors and nurses and scientists. Uh, but I do know that my kids are very much looking forward to summer camp, and my hope is that we will fight this virus so aggressively and be able to return kids to summer camp at some point over the summer. Um, but if that's not possible, uh, I will probably give, make my kids do a lot of reading and a lot of playing outside. Um, but I do go back and forth to Washington, D.C. And, and the district, so if I'm not, if I'm not making them uh, do a lot of reading and uh, a lot of playing outside, um, their dad will. And they'll probably play some video games and lots of Uno attack as well. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, we're gonna try and go back to some of our friends that we missed in our raise your hand line here. So Declan, uh, Declan, you are on. When you're ready to ask your question for the Congresswoman, go ahead. So, um, I'm Declan. How are we going to have the, um, the presidential elections in the fall with all this COVID-19 going around? That's a very good question, Declan. And that's a question that's really important to a lot of people. Um, every American, I hope, uh, because our civic engagement is important. Um, so we do have November elections. Um, in Virginia, in November, we will have elections for the president, a Senate race, and then all of our congressional seats. And that's what I have. I, I'm in a congressional seat. Um, and so here in Virginia, there's a couple different options. We have absentee voting. And so for any um, adult who can vote, you can vote by mail if you choose to do that. So for anyone who wants to vote early before the November election, just to make sure that they have put their vote out there, they can vote by mail or they can go down to the registrar, again, assuming it's open, um, in November and vote in person if they just want to avoid crowds. What is normally the wonderful thing about election day is there's all these excited Americans who are getting out and voting and sometimes they bring kids with them and you know the lines can be long and people talk and sometimes there's people there with flyers and sometimes candy and it's it's a I think a day of celebration because it's really a day when we get to do our duty as Americans and vote uh, for the people who we want to have represent us. Um, but we may not be able to have that type of celebration and we may not want to see the lines of people because that might be a place where we could spread this virus. So um, I would recommend that for anyone uh, here in Virginia, I hope that many people will choose to vote by mail or choose to vote early in person absentee um, so that we don't have huge crowds on election day. Uh, there, some of the scientists have talked about the fact that the virus might go away for a little bit and then come back. And so we need to be prepared for that. In Congress, we're talking about how to help states who uh, need to um, 
who, who will be able to help states so that uh, their citizens uh, and, and their residents can vote by mail um, if that's what, how they need to vote. Um, and certainly that's a, a good option, but um, we are still having our election in November, but we do need to plan for the fact that there could be uh, problems because of the virus. Um, if it comes back or you know, if it goes away a little bit, um, a couple weeks ago, there was an election in, um, in Wisconsin and there were a lot of people lined up all over the place. And we know that some of the people who stood in lines and some of the people who work at elections, that they did get sick and they spread the virus there. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen in Virginia or anywhere else in this country. Thank you, Congresswoman. We have a question uh, through the Q&A from Joshua, not sure how old Joshua is, and Becca, who is 11, uh, and they both ask, what is the hardest or most difficult part of serving in Congress right now? The, um, the hardest part about serving in Congress right now is the fact that we're in a crisis. It's also exactly why I wanted to run for Congress, because I wanted to represent this district um, and, and serve the people of this district. And that service isn't meant to just be when things are okay and normal and easy, that service is about when people really, really need help. And so one of the biggest challenges right now is that there are so many people across our district who are hurting, who are sick, who have family members who are sick, people who have lost their jobs, people who are really, really concerned um, about how they're going to pay their bills and how they're going to pay for their house and for food. Um, and I'm very... Um, I'm very humbled by the fact that I can help people in this job and that my whole office can help people. We've put a lot of different resource guides together. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the phone answering questions, helping people um, address the problems that they have. And so the biggest challenge is also exactly why it is that I, I feel lucky to have this job where I can help. Um, you know, I also join with all of the other members of Congress from across the country and the senators from across the country uh, to pass a couple different packages. And so I covered this earlier, packages are really large bills that touch on a variety of different things to help the American people and to help small businesses and to help our hospitals. And so to be able to vote to provide the help that I know is going to be important back home in Virginia um, is, it's because of the challenge of now um, that, that we're making those decisions. And, um, you know, the, the challenging piece is really hearing the difficult stories. Um, but dealing with challenges like those are exactly why, um, why I wanted to run for Congress and why I um, wanted to represent this district and help people. Thank you, Congresswoman. We have time just for uh, one more question from Akani, who sent in, how can I help right now during uh, this crisis as a kid? So I don't know how old Akani is, but I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. There's so many ways that you can help. You can know that because you're not in school, you're helping. That's, that's why uh, the, you know, we close schools or the grownups close schools or the governor closed schools is to keep the spread of the virus um, at bay and to not have it spread in schools. Uh, you can help by, if you're at home with brothers or sisters, by um, you know, helping them, by playing games, by doing the homework that your teachers assign. Uh, you can help stop the spread of this virus by washing your hands at least 20 seconds uh, with soap. When you go out in public, if you go to the store, if you have to go to the store, wear a mask. If you see other kids in your neighborhood or by your house, you know, stay a little bit further apart. You wanna stay six feet apart. You can talk, you can wave. Um, but the changes and the sacrifices that you're making in your life, that's helping. And, and if you're a little bit older and you have the ability to, you can, um, you know, if you wanna collect uh, canned goods to give to the food bank, you can do that. Um, if you want to write a thank you note for any of the essential workers in your community, the mail carrier, the garbage collection uh, workers, 
uh, the UPS or FedEx driver, uh, any doctors or nurses or medical assistants who might live near you, just making sure that people know uh, that you appreciate the work they're doing to help keep you and the community safe and the community going, that's good. Um, but we're, you know, we're gonna get through this. It's a really challenging time. It, life is different for everybody. Uh, everybody's making a lot of sacrifices and a lot of people are hurting. So the most that we can do, the most important thing that we can do right now is, is show kindness. Um, and when you have the ability to help others, to use that ability uh, to try and brighten people's day, but also to make sure that we're stopping the spread of this virus. Thank you, Congresswoman Spanberger. Uh, we are coming to the end of our interactive Kids Town Hall today. Uh, Congresswoman Spanberger, do you have any last words for our participants today? I, I wanna say thank you to everybody who joined us. Thank you for the questions. Uh, please remember to wash your hands, wear a mask if you go out in public. Um, this is a challenging time for kids of all ages, uh, for some of the littlest ones. I know it's weird to not go to school or not be able to have play dates or play on the playground. Uh, for the older kids, you know, I, I know that you're worried about high school and school and what comes after this for jobs and for college options or next steps. Um, you know, Participating in events like this, I, I think is helpful. I would urge everybody to remain engaged in uh, their government, in civics, uh, because really it, it matters a lot. It matters, your voices matter. I'm grateful for the questions today. You know, uh, I was happy to have the chance to answer your questions, but more importantly, I was happy to have the opportunity to hear directly from you, uh, my constituents. So thank you for participating. We're having another town hall next week. Uh, that one is a little bit more focused on grown-up issues, but certainly for any of the older kids on the call, uh, we're going to be talking about unemployment. We're going to be talking about next steps. We're going to be talking about the bills we recently passed. If you want to join, uh, we'll have all of the information available on our Facebook page, on our uh, website, which is spanberger.house.gov. Uh, so please consider uh, attending that one if you'd like as well. That'll be telephone. Um, uh, telephone, we'll have it broadcast online as well. But to everybody of, of all ages, um, thank you for, uh, for tuning in today. Um, please stay safe. Please show kindness to those around you. Um, and we will get through this. And all of the adults across the 7th District I have talked to are working very, very hard so that we can get schools open, we can get businesses open, and we can get our community uh, on a path back to being um, normal again. So I hope everyone's staying safe. Thank you so much. And um, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Congresswoman. And thank you again to everyone who took time to join us today. We heard so many great questions from kids all across Virginia's 7th District. Again, if we didn't get to your question today, you can give our office a call at 804-401-4110. Uh, please stay tuned to Congresswoman Spanberger's website and social media for details on future events like this one. As the Congresswoman mentioned, we do have a telephone town hall coming up on Monday, uh, and details for that will be posted at spanberger.house.gov. Thank you again. Stay healthy and safe and have a great afternoon. Thank you.